Thank you very much for this. I'm honored and I'm very, I'm deeply honored. I grew up in both the fields of circadian rhythms. I guess I was more like born in the field of circadian rhythms and basic science. And so I live in both of these fields. So it is quite befitting that my topic should be bridging circadian and sleep science and becoming a neurologist and physician to really improve and enhance our lifespan. Bridging, these are the Chicago bridges, if you don't know, and I am from Chicago. And right there, there's a bit of, there's a clock there, there's daytime, there's nighttime, and it's really a very inspiring time. And thank you to the Northwestern University has supported all of this work throughout all these years. This is just for your information. So some of the learning objectives um, here, I'm not gonna read them, is really to give you this concept that sleep and circadian rhythms are truly inseparable in real life. And we should be thinking about that in our clinics. We should think about this in every patient that we see. And how can we then develop some circadian and sleep-based principles and interventions to improve our health span? And finally, to appreciate the future, the transformative potential of when we combine sleep and circadian processes as we move forward in our research, but also in our patients. First, I'll provide a really brief outline of the history. I think it's important. I think Mary spoke about this uh, as well of the development of circadian and sleep research, some of the perspectives, at least my own perspective, of how these fields involved and what is circadian disruption versus circadian disorder and perspectives from the circadian and sleep fields. A little brief um, review of some of the health consequences of circadian disruption, and then again, finally, the future of sleep medicine. So. In the beginning, there was darkness and there was light. Circadian rhythms, wake and sleep. And these are the behaviors that we look at every day. So this is really, I think Jay Pete said, I'm a farmer, <laughs> he, was, he learned about the light and dark cycle. It is one of the most potent, uh, I think, physical changes in our environment that drives our biology, our physiology, and many of our behaviors. So a little bit of very selected history. If you look at sleep science uh, development, you see that, you know, they, and circadian, they seem to have developed a little bit in parallel, and but occurring pretty much around the same time. And then uh, lots of new data excitement in the 1980s and to the 1990s on the discovery of the circadian clock genes a little bit less genetics in the sleep uh, area until probably a little bit later, but you see some of these, the discovery of REM sleep uh, and so forth. But you would think that they develop in parallel, but there's Nathaniel Kleitman, who we think is a sleep person, but in 1938, he already, what was he doing? Circadian experiments, the mammoth cave experiments in Kentucky. So there, we were there from the very beginning join at the hip from our founding uh, fathers. Some things that I will talk a little bit about, some of the major, in my opinion, findings that really integrated sleep and circadian rhythms was the development of the two model process of sleep regulation by Borbele. And then also more recently, the discovery that Circadian clock gene mutations, or the circadian clock genes, are actually not just for timing, but they're actually involved in the in sleep regulation, and altering those actually makes a big difference. Again, integrating this. And I only bring this up, this is 1991, and this little person here is me, and I was a postdoc, and this was my first major circadian and or sleep conference in which I actually spoke, and that was 1990, many, many years ago, so I've had some practice. 
And really in the last decade or so, we're beginning to see how sleep disruption, sleep quality affects human health at all levels. And very similarly, beginning to appreciate how circadian rhythms and circadian disruption are also integrated in these metabolic, immune, et cetera, systems. So this is so, we're, we, 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 we were at there at the beginning, we kind of develop a little bit in parallel, and we are now back because these two systems affect almost everything that in, 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 in health. So I mentioned earlier the two process uh, model sleep regulation, Barbore. This was a model that was a game changer, in my opinion. It was applicable to multiple levels of organization, from cells to behavior to humans. And it was conceptually critical at that point for really promoting that integration, at least in mammals and humans, of sleep and circadian, how they interact with each other and how they regulate uh, each other. And since has been modified and adapted to account for sex, for light influences, for the age, et cetera. So there's been tons of publications in this area, over 5,000 citations of the two process model. And it, it's still growing, it's 1982. It is getting, gaining more and more ground, and I believe that that has to do with our recognition that these two systems are indeed quite interactive and integrated. The other thing major uh, impact that's had on me was this uh, paper in 1995, Bert Durkian and Chuck Seisler, uh, who were at Harvard at the time. They proposed and they really, uh, promoted this, this um, force of syncreating model where you could dissociate by, you know, sleep and circadian processes by, by forcing an individual to be uh, living in periods, circadian periods for longer than 24 hours beyond the range of entrainment. And using this model and the EEG of sleep, they were able to demonstrate that there are circadian dependent processes in sleep as well as homeostatic processes, hence back to the two process uh, model being tested in humans. And not only was sleep propensity or wake propensity generally terms circadian gated uh, and, and homeostatic gated, but they were able to show that slow wave activity was a primary marker of the sleep homeostat, and that was less circadian gated, but homeostatic gated, whereas REM sleep was more uh, circadian gated, and even sleep spindle sigma was circadian control and also sleep regulation. So this really, I think, provided a lot of insight. Furthermore, if you want to go lo look at the molecular level from the circadian side, this is a circadian clock mutation. This is 1997. Joe Takahashi uh, is here. And it showed that there's this single mutation of a base pair substitution changed dramatically the circadian oscillation or the period of this um, mouse. You can see from a wild type being a little shorter than 24 hours to a clock clock mutation was much longer. Now, that was great. That was a fundamental discovery, in, at least in mammalian genetics with circadian rhythms. But Fred Turek, Eric Naylor, who was a postdoc at the time, found that this clock mutation, this, cir this core clock circadian mutation, also affected sleep homeostasis by they were more awake, less sleep, including changes in REM sleep. So you can see this integration of these two systems. So many, many years, last 20 years or so, which I think we're beginning to really see that some of these fundamental discoveries have at least changed my view of what the importance role of sleep and circadian rhythms are in health and disease. One, sleep is not only a global phenomenon, but of course it is as we recorded by the EEG, but also local uh, brain phenomena. And many of you who have done this work are uh, in this audience. Uh, sleep can be cellular, not the EEG itself, but certainly uh, in molecular, these rest uh, activity cycles. And very similarly, that of circadian rhythms, as I mentioned earlier, the discovery of the clock gene uh, machinery, it really exists in virtually all cells, nearly all cells. And 
importantly for both sleep and circadian rhythms, that these processes are integrated into metabolic, immune, neural pathways, uh, et cetera. So they, that together, separately and together, they have tremendous influence on health. And if you want to go a little bit even further, this is a clock mutation, a core clock gene, BMAL1. And Katema Paul's group has found that it can, in skeletal muscle, if you mutate this, if you alter that function, skeletal muscle, it actually regulates sleep homeostasis, changes sleep, especially non-REM sleep. It's really quite a tremendous look and back and forth. And that because these genes are in every tissue, uh, almost nearly every tissue of your body, every organ, they need to be synchronized. And you can see this picture here from her that whether it's the skin, the muscle, the brain tissues, they are all synchronized and in synchrony with each other. Well, now that begs the question, which rhythm to measure if there's rhythms in every tissue? Uh, well, we can measure the central clock, that's the discovery of the supercosmetic, you know, but that's pretty difficult um, to do in real life. What about clock inputs? We can certainly measure light inputs, activity with, the, with our octa watches, feeding, uh, and more recently, re the resurgence of the importance of temperature. And that then could look at clock outputs or pathways that are regulated by clock, by the central clock, melatonin, cortisol, temperature, cardiovascular systems, and the development now of other biomarkers genetic biomarkers, core clock genes, as well as other proteins and metabolites. Many of you are doing this work uh, right here. Now, the other question is, all right, what do you measure? But which of the circadian measures should you measure, whether you're doing research, especially for those of us who are doing sleep research, and or in the clinic? So this is something that all circadian biologists know by heart. This is the Bible, but uh, I just thought I would be a refresher that the period of oscillation, or we call tau, or the frequency of the oscillation, is really when you see the point that you, could, you go from top, you know, from, from the phase, I mean, not that phase, you, you go from the complete oscillation from bottom to top, you can see over here. And then the other concept that has kind of lost a little bit, but is becoming clinically hugely important, is that of amplitude. And that is really, you know, either you can measure from the top to the bottom, but it's really the amplitude of that sine wave or of that rhythm. But what we are most obviously aware of, especially as sleep physicians, is the phase. We talk about phase disorders, phase. And phase is really that timing is really the timing of that rhythm. It could be, you could look at it as the acrophase or the nadir of the rhythm. It really doesn't matter where you decide that is, but it's the acrophase. And then we talk about phase differences, this phase angle that would be the difference between two rhythms and their phase. And and I think that's an important concept. So when we talk about phase, you can think about phase in relationship from the central clock to the environment or to the peripheral clocks that I just mentioned earlier, or peripheral clocks with each other. They could be aligned or misaligned. And then the word entrainment, I think Dr. Sizer says, we shouldn't call circadian rhythm sleep-weight disorders, phase disorders. They're disorders of entrainment. So entrainment is that coupling of these endogenous oscillators to a external stimulus, for example, such as the light-dark cycle, that results in the period of these two oscillations to be either together or at least one is following the other. And that would create a state of more stable phase alignment. So what is circadian disruption? I hear this a lot. Uh, and the literature has a lot of titles called circadian disruption. But I think that means that we don't really know what we mean. Because it's like it's a nonspecific umbrella term for dysregulation, disturbance, any problem that could negatively affect the function of, of the system could be at any level of, of organization. Probably the most common type of circadian disruption that we see certainly clinically is circadian misalignment. And that is when the, 
the underlying circadian rhythm is in the abnormal phase with other cycles. There could be another circadian rhythm, or it could be something like a zygaber or something that is external, like the light dark cycle, or your eating, feeding behaviors. So in health, if you look at these three rhythms, they bear a phase relationship with each other. They have a high amplitude, so that looks like it's a healthy rhythm. Whereas in disease, you can either have a low amplitude rhythm and or you could have a rhythm that is not phase aligned with each other or with that of the light dark cycle or zygabers or the environment. So in hence, when you look at sleep disruption, we think about the environment, uh, like dark cycle, your social schedules, the feeding behaviors, your sleep-wake cycle, being out of sync or misaligned with that of your internal clocks. That then causes slow circadian disruption or a circadian disorder, depending on whether uh, you're a clinician, you'll probably call it a circadian uh, disorder. And not only that, but you can get misalignment of your internal tissues uh, as well from a circadian clock standpoint. And that has been shown to be a risk factor for many, many health conditions, neurologic, psychiatric. You can read those. I'm not going to go through all of those. And that list is ever growing. But of course, for us here in this audience and clinicians, we think a circadian disorder as the circadian sleep-wake disorders, whereas the circadian biologist is thinking about it in this huge context that anything that disturbs the circadian system could be a circadian disorder. So I think we need to be uh, thinking about that. And not only that, we also know that those, you know, illness or disease can also cause circadian disruption and, of course, sleep disruption. So from the lens of a clinical sleep person, I myself have always seen circadian rhythm disorder as a sleep-wake disorders and not beyond that, and I hope that we will be able to expand that uh, further. And, and so it, even though this is our flagship circadian disorder, the sleep-wake disorders, we know very little about it. The ICSD-3 recommends that we look at the clock do some circadian biomarkers, but it's not required. And we know very well from all the research and work that the wall clock does not equal your biological internal clock, and yet we're assuming that it does in our clinical practice. If you look at this little red dot there, that is dim light melatonin onset, a classical gold standard for circadian uh, timing. And in the dashed vertical line is when the person is falling asleep. And you can see here from this workshop funded by the SRS that and ASM together that people can sleep two to three hours, fall asleep two to three hours after their dim light melatonin. And that's a normal phase relationship. But individuals can also fall asleep earlier than their DLMO or much, much later. So it's not good enough, right? It's not good enough. Here's an example. This is a 29-year-old patient of mine who came with difficulty falling asleep two, three o'clock in the morning. He couldn't get up in the morning to get to work uh, in time, although it was already 7.45, and he gained some weight. Very short story. This is his actigraphy record, and you can see from the red line that indeed he is falling asleep on the average, about two or three o'clock in the morning, waking up around, you know, fairly late, maybe about nine uh, a.m. But on in the in the purple line, you can see that those are the days he has to go to work, and he's waking up much earlier, and he's continuously sleep deprived. Sounds like ICSD, DSWPD, right? Of course. Well, this is his melatonin, salivary melatonin. The onset is at 7.30 p.m. That is actually a bit early, not late. So what's going on here? Does this patient have a circadian disorder? Some, some may say no. And indeed, about you know 50%, this is from uh, Jade Murray and 
and Shampel's group in, in Monash, that 50% of delayed sleep phase are not circadian delayed according to the dim light melatonin onset time, which is a marker of the central clock. We're not even thinking about what's going on with the peripheral clocks here. So perhaps we have a non-circadian DSWPD, and then they call it a behavioral DSWPD. I like to think that because we don't know why there is this kind of, let's call it the, se the second group, that our patient who probably has a circadian disorder, I like to think of it like a narcolepsy, adopt that DSWPD type one with delay dim light melatonin onset and DSPD type two without delay, not assuming that they're not circadian because the circadian system is very, very broad. And of course, we do need these circadian biomarkers. We need to be able to, in the clinic, to, distin to distinguish this. This is a picture of Dr. Abbott, who is the director of our circadian medicine clinic at Northwestern. She's doing pupillometry here in our patients. And, uh, and this is, I mean, it's not important to go through all of this, but what she has found was that in this group of delayed sleep-wake phase disorder patients, that and you look at their post-illumination pupillary reflex, that they, it's, a, it's, it's abnormal in the sense that they don't keep their pupils constricted for a long enough time. And you can see that in the blue. These are the delayed sleep phase. In the blue is the, in response to the bright to bright uh, blue light. And in the, in, and you can see in the, in, the, in, in the solid line in the blue that this is the, the, those, the, the, their pupil stays dilated, implying that there may be an alteration in the melanopsin system. And she found that it's fairly specific, and, and there's high sensitivity specificity, about 80%, using this to distinguish those who are not delayed, DSWPDs, versus those who are delayed and who have late melatonin onsets. So potentially in the future, pupillometry could be one of these tools that we can use uh, in the clinic. Now I'm gonna move to what I think is really one of the uh, areas that really kind of combines sleep and circadian. It's really the power of light, this light-dark cycle that we live in. We tend to think of light as circadian effects. Uh, they phase shift the clock. They may, they increase, they, they, they're important for entrainment of the circadian uh, rhythms and also more daytime light can increase the amplitude of circadian rhythms in both animals and also in humans. But there we're beginning to recognize broadly from Samar Hattar's work and many others that there are also non-circadian effects of light and those also have important uh, implications for health outcomes. Whether we're looking studies on natural light has been shown higher levels of natural light exposure, improvements in physical health and many domains, including cognition, uh, mental health, but also sleep quality, which of course in itself affects all of these other health outcomes. Many studies that I'm not going to be able to uh, discuss on artificial light, both the beneficial effects of artificial light during the day and the negative effects of artificial light during the night, and especially, for example, lots of trials going on cancer fatigue, et cetera. But I do want to highlight just one study because I like him. No. <laughs> and this is Alex Vidanovich's study, which I think exemplifies what the power of light is and what can, you can do with it in looking at the future. This is a study that he did many years ago now uh, at Northwestern, where small sample size, and he looked and said, I can give bright light to these patients with Parkinson's disease. And very simple protocol, 1,000 lux, uh, kind of in the morning, in the, in, in the late afternoon, two weeks. That was just very cute. It decreased the upper sleepiness scale by a lot. Okay, this is CPAP levels of decrease. Uh, sleep quality improved, sleep fragmentation decreased. Physical activity, motor activity was higher during the day and also improved some of the measures of the Parkinson's disease rating scale, disease rating scale. So what does that do? This is the future. 
It led to this really amazing study called the NYPD study, funded by, N by NIH through the Neural Next uh, Network to use in a multi-center study to look at bright light therapy in patients with Parkinson's disease. This is the type of work we need more of, really this multi-center trial to show that these circadian interventions, the sleep interventions, actually can be scalable to the population. So it is not how much, but also when. Timing is very, very important. These are the light mountains in our, at night in our cities. And if we have light exposure, we're messing up our circadian system. Some of us even sleep with our lights on, and that messes up our system. And if you're doing all this, you're sleeping late, you're also eating late. And the NIH has been very interested in this aspect that perhaps, you know, light could be this one modifiable factor that affects our biology widely, but also something that has social implications. Uh, and, and, and really in large cities, pay people in lower socioeconomic classes, they tend to live in these large cities in these corridors at night where there's light from the street lamps uh, and also from just you know other other rooms. I just want to highlight a couple uh, newer studies that our group has done, and this is work by Minji Kim using actigraphy. And this is in older adults. She looked at the association between light at night, any light at night. This is mainly during the sleep period with obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. And you can see that the prevalence of those sleeping with their lights on, any amount of light, this could be zero crossing of that you know, on, on the active watch, increase the risk, uh, the prevalence for obesity, a change in BMI from early times to later times, as we have almost 40 years later, uh, as well as diabetes, hypertension, uh, et cetera. And these, uh, and it's pretty, I think it's pretty significant. I'm not saying that's re that they're due to each other, but certainly begs that question. Furthermore, she went on to analyze the data from the new moms-to-be, and this is again using actigraphy uh, from Francesca Facco and Get Force Kathy Reed. And what she showed was that if during that little, it's, it's light there. There's no difference between those with gestational diabetes with, with regards to their activity levels. There was only a difference in the light exposure three hours before bedtime. Those who had, who had G, uh, gestational diabetes were the ones who all more likely also had exposure to light before bedtime. It's just, this is another way of showing that difference. Those with uh, GDM are the ones in the red. And when she then analyze this data and either uh, unadjusted and or adjusted for as many things as she could adjust for, you can see that the odds ratio is fairly high. We're talking four, three, four, for if you are exposed to light three hours before bedtime uh, or close to that period, you are, not you, but these women are a higher risk. So what may be the mechanisms? This is work done by Ivy Chung. This is her, I think this was her postdoctoral uh, dissertation, if you call it. She took very, very healthy young people who were good sleepers, who had no face problems uh, at all. She brought them in into the laboratory, and she basically randomized to either sleeping one, everybody slept in dim light conditions, and then randomized to either sleeping with 100 lux or sleeping with three lux at night, one single night. And it had really, I think, sig significant effects on glucose. This is from the oral glucose tolerance test in the morning. Now, you look at glucose. It didn't really change very much in the light conditions because these were healthy young people. But look how much more insulin they had to secrete to be able to maintain glucose homeostasis. Uh, and this is in the light condition, whereas we did not see that in the dark condition. That then translates, when you look at higher insulin secretion in the OGTT, that translates then into, oops, sorry, into more higher tissue level insulin resistance. 
And you can see that particularly in the early phase uh, of, of, of insulin and together really the HAMA IR was altered. So just one night of light sleep in 100 lux, eyes closed, sleep. Uh, these individuals were really not quite aware that their sleep was disrupted at all, although there were some changes uh, in their sleep um, architecture. Furthermore, which was unexpected to me, was that this is why you do the sleep studies and you record everything, do the PSG, the heart rate in the light condition throughout the entire night was higher, was elevated throughout the entire night compared to that. You see no differences between the nights in the baseline compared to the night light to the second night in the dark uh, condition. So this is work done by Daniela Grimaldi, and she plots this out, and she says, furthermore, the change in heart rate is correlated with a change of insulin that we saw, higher insulin, higher heart rate. So there's some type of sympathetic uh, activation going on. And basically, higher sympathetic activity was seen in the group that was exposed to light at night during their sleep period. Let's move on to timing of feeding. There's a lot of work, basic science work. I can't, I'm just gonna show a couple of these that really made the human feel think, well, what about in humans? And clearly many, many studies, beautiful studies from many of these major groups, from the panda, from Marie Sing Ong, uh, Courtney, uh, and, 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 and so forth, and Frank Shear, who's been doing a lot of this work, beautiful work in, in the laboratory as well as in the field. But I just want to show you one little one that we, are that we have been working on for the last several years now. This is part of our program project grant, but also one of our R01s, where we're looking at, can we enhance kind of circadian signaling, mainly metabolic signaling, uh, to improve sleep and cardiometabolic function? So we're trying to strengthen the amplitude. We're not phase shifting these individuals, at least we weren't trying to do that, to enhance their metabolic, cardiometabolic rhythms and maybe decrease some of, or, or decrease some of these risk factors for CVD. These were individuals who were already at risk for cardiometabolic disease or overweight, but they did not have diabetes and they could have had controlled hypertension. And this is so, and they were randomized to an extended overnight fast or just whatever they were doing um, before. Um, and this work is done by uh, Kathy Reed, Daniela Grimaldi, Sabra Abbott, and Kristen Knutson. So here's just one example of the actigraphy of this protocol. In this dashed lines is their extended overnight fasting period. Blue is when they're sleeping, their sleep period. That we monitor those in the field, and then we brought them into the clinical research unit for three days to do all kinds of like monitoring, you know, 20, you know, 24 hour blood draws, uh, very deep physiology, as you might. And then we gave them a prescription to extend their, their overnight fast by about two hours. And then they were able to maintain that, as you can see, over a six week period. This was a six week uh, intervention. They did food diaries every day uh, on their phone. We, 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 we used this, the food logger, and we did during their, we did continuous glucose monitoring in the field. And then when they came in for the clinical research uh, visits, we did sleep, uh, circadian measures of cortisol, melatonin, many of the metabolic measures. And Joe Bass, uh, who is our partner in all of this, uh, runs that core and has been helping us uh, with this. I'm going to just show you one piece of preliminary data from this huge amount of work that we have not quite finished yet. It, the, extending the overnight fast is not intended decrease wake after sleep onset, improve sleep quality in these individuals. It also decreased, heart, uh, decreased blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure. Many of them became dippers, when, whereas they were not dippers. And even the somewhat dippers became more dippers. Again, something that we may or may not have expected. I don't have all the metabolic data uh, back yet, and we are still working on that. 
So if then you look at the relationship between wake after sleep onset and this nocturnal dipping of the diastolic blood pressure, there is a really good correlation. Our sample size is still very small, but it's quite, or it's already, uh, I think, significant, so something for us to really be thinking about. Finally, it is much more than the few things that I have showed you. The implications of sleep and circadian disturbance are really, really broad across many of these areas. I only highlight in the red some of the areas that we are working at Northwestern, and I don't have time, of course, to um, talk about any of these except for one, and that is uh, in the ICU, critical illness in the ICU done by uh, Matthew Moss. It was part of his K-23, but now, of course, he's this, he has an illustrious career on, uh, on his own at the time. So we thought too much light at night, right? Too much light in the ICU all the time. Well, when you actually do, this is why science is important, you actually measure it. It was not too much light only at night. It was not enough light during the day. And I thought, this is good because I can do something about that. I probably can't dim those lights off too much at night. So that was what this uh, shows across the brain. And then looked at melatonin, because these individuals, you could draw blood from them because they had arterial line in, in the ICU. And you can see that some of them just have very high levels of melatonin in the red because they were on pressors, right? That increased the sympathetic, uh, the, uh, the ad adrenergic tone, and then you get more melatonin. But those who were not, you can see that by and large on the bottom part, they would have very low amplitude of the melatonin rhythm. Oops. Ooh. And he has also shown, similarly, if you look at circadian clock genes, uh, expression some of the circadian clock genes that those in the ICU had in the orange part. You can see very low amplitude circadian gene, clock gene fluctuations or cycling across the 24 hours. So he concluded that the circadian rhythm disruption during critical illness is not limited to the brain only, but also to the peripheral tissues, not only to sleep, but also to the circadian system, which may in part contribute to the sleep disturbances that we well know already. And that changing this milieu perhaps uh, can increase, improve mortality, I mean, can decrease mortality, but more importantly, improve uh, outcomes after for those who are surviving the ICU. So this is another really, I think, great opportunity as we look into the future. And the ATS has actually put together a workshop and they published a statement on this, which I think is really, really fabulous. So now I hope I've convinced you a little bit that the circadian sleep processes are, yes, they're separate, but they really do come together. And depending whether you're looking at it from the circadian point of view or the sleep point of view, it really, they're mirror images of, of each other. So now about circadian clinical development. We did the research timeline. Again, very, uh, very, uh, I would say, selected uh, things. But I want to point out, which is very clear here, that the sleep field has been much more advanced clinically than the circadian field, at least in this timeline. The uh, Association of Psychological Study of Sleep, which preceded what we call now the SRS, the Sleep Research Society. The American, uh, the Association of Sleep Disorder Centers, ASDC. This was in the 1960s, 1970s, right? And you can see the Stanford, we talked about Bill DeMent, the first circadian medicine, I mean, circadian medicine, that's, that's us later. The sleep medicine clinic was established in that time. And the Association of yeah, Sleep Societies, APSS, on and on, clinical development, you can see in, in it just in the 1990s and 2000, it became a board of medical uh, specialties. You had your own fellowship, training, all of you out here, you know, in sleep medicine and the practice of sleep medicine. Whereas the term circadian, if you think about, in even in the Sleep Research Society, was only introduced in 2010 in the strategic plan of the Sleep Research Society. And more and more now, uh, I'm seeing that even clinical centers and clinical research centers in sleep, the traditional sleep centers, have included the word circadian 
sleep and circadian, so this is really, really uh, great. And what we're coming back together again because the circadian system, the sleep systems are integrated. They affect multiple organ systems. They affect every aspect of our health. And hence, the circadian medicine clinics only became almost 50 years after the establishment of the, I guess, ASM, to, to some degree, are we developing circadian medicine clinics. We, I'm very proud that we have the, one of the first circadian medicine clinics in the country, and this is run by Dr. Sabra Abbott right now. We have a whole list of things that we do. As you can see over here, we try using biomarkers, both behavioral, physiological biomarkers, to assess circadian timing, circadian phase, not quite yet amplitude in these patients who come to us with circadian disorders to be able to, I think, personalize their circadian profile. And we do more routinely than other places, actigraphy and also assessment of dim light melatonin onset. But the hardest thing that I actually had to do was to get a plaque made for this new, for this new clinic. It was five or six years later after the establishment that I could even get a plaque change. And I said, I'm quitting. This is ridiculous. Every chair, every dean I spoke to, they go, oh, that's a good idea. But I never did it until really quite recently when we moved. So this is the challenge of that. Today, we have uh, now incorporated the international Association of Circadian Health Clinics, led by the Monash Group, by Sancha. Uh, and you can see it's just the beginning of this international coalition. This is to provide things like the Common Dictionary to define key circadian terms that can be applicable in clinical medicine, make recommendations for in-home circadian phase assessment. How can you actually do that at a clinical level? Establish a set of standards for treatment protocols. We don't have that. Basically, accordingly, much we don't have that type of um, guidelines as far as, uh, as I can tell right now, but hopefully it will be changing in the future. And Dr. Seisler wants to update the nosology of circadian uh, disorders, not just circadian rhythm, sleep work disorders, uh, to really include from what we know about the mechanisms. Finally, there's a huge amount of opportunity to apply circadian and sleep science to maintain the health span, performance, and general well-being. We can think about timing of drugs, buildings, lighting, dynamic lighting, operational procedures in the hospitals, in our nursing homes. Can we protect sleep? Can we enhance circadian uh, function? And I think from those those of us who see patients in the clinic, that we are thinking about circadian when we see our patients, even if they have sleep apnea, there's data that they are. Patients with um, who are on CPAP, morning larks, appear to be more compliant by about 40 so minutes to CPAP. Why might that be? So it's important to ensure that our patients with unrecognized circadian disorders become recognized by us sleep specialists. And then really consider circadian dysregulation or disruption, as I broadly would call it, in the assessment and diagnosis and treatment. So timing of when you get these diagnostic testings, when you draw blood, might be very important. Looking at the future, chronodiagnostics is going to be a big thing and how we get that biologic timing into the clinic. We can go with sensors, multiple sensors, looking at the same rhythm, you know, whether it's melatonin or heart rate variability or heart rate across many, many time points, across the 24 hours, or more recently, the idea of using artificial intelligence, but using modeling to be able to look at perhaps getting markers, blood markers, metabolite markers, or other markers with, with, with one sample or maybe two samples, which would be more clinically scalable uh, using types of omics to estimate circadian phase. And finally, uh, Dr. Churik is here. He's the P one of the PIs of this multi-center study, which I was told I could show uh, at this point. This is science fiction looking to the future. And 
This is not, not wearables, but implantables and wearables uh, put together that where you can, a, a wearable can sense the internal uh, timing, whether it's heart rate variability or temperature, uh, and then estimate circadian phase, uh, and then it can speak to a system that can um, look at the desired phase based on what we know about phase response curves and then display that and then feedback. So basically, in a closed loop system, be able to determine what is the internal circadian phase, when, can we give a drug and or, in this case, implantable peptide uh, to the system while this is all in together without multiple systems? This is the ability, the power of AI to kind of integrate these types of things. So finally, some of the opportunities uh, and strategies, uh, collaboration with industry. I think this is going to be hugely important. Analytical advances are just coming media public interest. So thank you, Karen. Uh, this is really, really, really important. And we have multiple strategies. We should have a unified effort to do that. We need to collect large-scale circadian data in all our prospective cohorts. We talk about this sleep. We, we, we've made a dent in sleep, but there are very few circadian rhythm uh, or timing markers in any of our major basic cardiovascular metabolic uh, cohorts. And, and again, this consortium, developing of clinical consortiums and research consortiums to be able to collaborate and affect these changes. And, okay. So back to this picture of the mirror images of sleep and circadian uh, rhythms, that they should be integrated, they're really inseparable in our, daily, uh, in our daily lives. And I want to end with thanking a lot of people. These are the bridges. I have to remember my past or my, my history. Uh, I come from the thinking um, of Pittendridge and Dr. Uh, Michael Maneker, who were the mentors of my mentors, uh, Fred Turek, uh, also Joe Takahashi, and my clinical mentors, Donna Harder, who is the, who is the chair of neurology, who let me do all this crazy stuff, you know, at a time when he didn't think this was really anything at all. He said to me, you know, Phil, you're a neurologist and neuroscientist, you shouldn't really be doing sleep. Isn't that kind of psychology? So 1990, I developed this, and you can see those in the purple are those individuals who are still at Northwestern who've been the bridge makers to all of us and to everywhere. And then also to my circadian sleep medicine clinical ambassadors. These are the fellows that have come, the clinical fellows that have come through our program. Um, Dr. Uh, Kelly Jill is uh, here sitting there, and many of them have gone on to really incredibly illustrious careers. So I want to thank all of them, and you, because you train in the circadian medicine sleep com combined program, you are true the ambassadors for this new vision. And especially I want to thank the NIH and our funding agencies, Northwestern University, for when I didn't maybe had enough money, they gave me some money. And in the purple uh, are highlighted those individuals who are Northwestern, who uh, have done really, really the backbone of everything that I do. And I big call out to Kathy Reed, who has been my partner, I don't know, certainly more than 25 years, right? And I could not have done anything of this sort without her. I certainly wouldn't be standing here at all. And uh, of course, Joe Bass, uh, Ravi Alada, and Fred Turek, my mentor who I already mentioned. And then in the green are those selected people. There are many more that have just gone on, who trained with us, and who've gone on to incredibly lustrous academic careers uh, on their own. And then finally, to some of my mentors, Sonia and Cole Israel, who's been with me from the very, very beginning. I was a very junior faculty when she took an interest in my work and has been a mentor and friend throughout all this time. Evan Carter for giving me the first, and Fred for giving me the first opportunity to have a grant uh, in their program project grant, which now I lead. And Ruth Benka, Mary Karsgaden, Beth, all of you, and the women in sleep and circadian biology. You can see there are quite a few of them. It's not... <laughs> There's quite a few of them who supported me throughout this time. But yes, there are many men who also supported me 
and who I am deeply indebted. And there you are here. And I call upon you uh, all the time. So again, thank you, thank you very, very much for all of this. And finally, because I can, because I'm standing up here, give you a little philosophical instructions. This is from Mary Oliver. She says, instructions for living a life, pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. And whether you're a researcher or a clinician, this is really important. And I would add, Sleep and circadian researchers and clinicians pay attention to your patients, to the, to the, to the findings. Be astonished. I am still astonished every time I see a melatonin profile of a delayed sleep phase patient and it fits. I go, this is amazing. Biology is truly amazing. And as I'm doing now, tell about it. So thank you very much.